If you are new, we've been going through the book of John. We've made it to John chapter 12. So if you'd open your Bibles to John chapter 12, we'll be starting in verse 27. Last uh, time we were here, two weeks ago, we saw Jesus. We, it was a triumphal entry, remember? And we saw Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and um, with a multitude of people urging him on. And they were, you know, laying down palms at his, at his feet, you know, for the, to walk on. And they were ready to go to war, weren't they? You know, the palms was a, it was a political symbol of, you know, they were ready to, to take on the Romans and, and challenge the Roman authority. And they believed that Jesus was the guy to lead them in that. They believed that they could do it. And they really put their lives on the line by, by this, this, this was a show of protest that the Romans would have noticed. And by them rushing, coming out of the city and forming this great multitude of people while the Romans were there to, to quell any, you know, to, any any rebellion that might take place. So they were claiming rebellion by going out there to meet Jesus and waving palm branches and, and all that they were doing. And they were ready to go to battle with Jesus. They were ready for war. And we talked about that last week. Know who you're going to war with before you decide to go to battle. You know, this should, they were ready to make him king, weren't they? They were Hosanna in the highest. They were ready to make him king. And this should have been a glorious time for our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. It really should have been. But Luke tells us as he, as he looked over them and as he looked over Jerusalem, what did he do? He wept. He wept. He felt sorry for them because they missed it, didn't they? They want to make him king, but not the kind, but he was, and he would be king. And he allowed them to do that, yet he wasn't going to be the kind of king that they expected him to be, that they wanted him to be, I should say. They expected and wanted from him. They wanted an earthly king. They wanted a king here and now. And and that wasn't the king he was going to be. Um, They wanted their physical freedom, didn't they? Which, Which is temporary. And Jesus was offering them spiritual freedom, which is eternal. And, and what's so, you know, what's more important? He wept over them because they were, they, were, they were missing what he really, what was really important to them because they couldn't see past their self, selfishness. They couldn't see past what was best for them in the here and now and, and focus on what is really important. You know, they were deaf, deaf to what Jesus was saying about himself because they were only able to hear what they wanted to hear. That's why he always says, if you have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Because if you don't, if all you have ears to hear is what you want to hear, we've talked about it. It's a phenomenon. We, can, we, we have this ability to hear what we want to hear and discard everything that we don't want to hear. You know, all they wanted to hear what was self-pleasing. You know, this is the guy who's going to deliver us from the Roman oppression. You know, so what does he do? He tells the Greeks who were in town. There were Greeks in town to check out the feast, maybe be a part of it. Um, we don't know for sure, but they were, wanted, they were there for Passover, even though they weren't Jewish. And he tells them that he would be a king, but not the king that people were expecting. One who rules, he would be one who would rule, but in a different way, in a self-sacrificial way, wouldn't it? You know, and it wouldn't be as an earthly king. Um, he spoke of his death. You know, he, sp- you know he, he talked about his death as a grain of wheat, that unless it falls to the ground and dies, you know, it won't bear fruit. And he's speaking of the cross, and his mind, th- his mind is going to the cross. And we're in the last week of his life, and he's thinking about what is about to transpire and what he is about to face as he's talking to these Greeks about his death and, and the cross and, and dying. And, and, he, and he tells, you know, he says we need to follow his example. You know, don't lose, don't love this life so much that you lose eternal life. And really a key verse is verse 25, anyone who loves his life will lose it. Anyone who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What a powerful verse. I mean, we could talk a lot about that, can't we? But that's a key verse in in this gospel. Um, When he said, you know, anyone who hates his life, just meaning you don't hate your life. Did Jesus hate his life? I think Jesus loved his life. He enjoyed life. I think he enjoyed working as a carpenter. You know, God got to be a carpenter, you know, and God got to help people and, and, and build things for people and, and be part of a community. Isn't that what he's, oh, God's always wanted? 
He's always wanted to, just to walk and, and fellowship with, with his creation. Jesus got to do that as a man. I think Jesus loved his life. He loved people. He loved building things. And I, I think he loved his life. He's, but he's not saying hate, hate your life. He's saying love it less. Don't prioritize your life here over your eternal life, over your spiritual life. You know, love it less than what, what's really important, your spiritual life. You know, he just, he didn't hate his life. He just lived it with a higher purpose, didn't he? His purpose wasn't just to build and make money and, 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 be, and, and enjoy life here. He had a higher purpose in life, just like we do. Don't we have a higher purpose than just to eat and drink and be happy? We have a higher purpose. If you're a Christian, you have a higher purpose, a higher calling than just to live life just to make money, just to provide, just we have a higher purpose in life. What happens when we live a higher purpose than ourselves? What happens when we live this life with a higher purpose than ourselves? Doesn't mean everything's going to be easy, does it? Sometimes their higher purpose, God's purpose for your life, might cause turmoil in your life. It might cause grief in your life. It might cause burdens in your life that you wouldn't have had otherwise if you were living for yourself. When the purpose of our life is to die to self, isn't that our purpose? To die to self? To die to what pleases the flesh? To live to please God and to glorify God? Well, it's not always going to be a bed of roses. Look what Jesus says when, he's, when he talks about his purpose, about dying to himself, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. As he's thinking about this, Jesus tells us what that will be like in verse 27 and 28. He says, now my soul is troubled. Okay. Living for a higher purpose, his soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. My soul is troubled. And what shall I say? The soul is what? The seed of our, our thoughts and our emotions. Jesus is talking from, he's speaking from his thoughts, what he's thinking, and his emotions. Jesus was emotional. Jesus thought as a man thinks, as a human being thinks. He processed things as a human being. He had the same emotions that we have. Where do we get our emotions? From God. Jesus is displaying his emotions. He's, he's not that character you see on some of the, the Christian movies that's just stoic, you know, no emotions. Jesus had emotions. As he contemplated the cross, he got emotional. As he contemplated his death, he got emotional. You know, many translations will read, my soul is deeply troubled. Deeply troubled. The complete Jewish Bible, which I've been going to a lot, I just really found this, this translation and I, and I like it. It says, now I am in turmoil. Now I am in turmoil. So there's, a, there's something serious going on. It's not just he's a little emotional. He's, in ter he's deeply troubled. He's very emotional as he's contemplating this final week of his life, as he's contemplating his death. And he verbalizes it. You know, he, this, this coming dread that, that overwhelms his emotions. He, he's verbalizing it. Isn't that great? You know, I, I'm not good at verbalizing my emotions. I'd like to shove them down in. I'm, you know, I've gotten real. I used to be really good at suppressing my emotions. So the closer I get to Jesus, the harder it is for me to suppress my emotions. I, they become more verbal. Why is that? Because Jesus does the same thing. He verbalizes his emotions. He doesn't hide them. He doesn't suppress them. I used to be really good at that. I tuck them deep down. Men are good at that. We have boxes for everything in our brains, don't we? And there's boxes I've buried and thrown away up in the attic, and they're just dust. Jeez, the closer I get to Jesus, I, 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 I get more emotional, and I express my emotions more. You guys know that if you've been coming here. And, and I just think that's because as we become more like him, he, he did not hide his emotions. He expresses his emotions. 
kind of, <laughs> I was thinking, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about Joyce, as we're going up Pikes Peak on the motorcycle, you know, it's 14,000 feet and there's no guardrails and it just drops right, to, well, the whole way she's verbalizing her emotions as she, <laughs> as she contemplates the coming dread like, of falling off this mountain and, and constantly in my ear is, the, is her verbalizing her emotions. <laughs> But it was nothing like that for Jesus. Now, what was Jesus dreading so much? What was he, why was he dreading you know, this so much that, that he got emotional? You know, we, saw him in, we see him in the garden you know, sweating profuse, profusely, isn't he? You know, thinking about you know, the cross and, and this, you know, what he's, this anguish. Why? Because he's following his father's will, isn't it? He's following his father's will. Following his father's will caused him great anguish. Sometimes following God's will for your life will cause you great anguish. Yeah, that preaches, doesn't it? Yeah, we don't like to preach that. You don't hear that in too many. Following the will of God will sometimes cause great anguish in your, will cause your soul to be deeply troubled. He was fulfilling his purpose which caused him to be deeply troubled, which caused him to sweat like drops of blood because he was following his Father's will. Sometimes being a Christian, you, how do you know you're a Christian? How do you know you're following the Father's will sometimes? It's sometimes it's because your soul is troubled at where he's leading you to. He's not always leading you to just, you know, fun and games. Sometimes he is leading you to places that no one else is willing to go or to do things that no one else is willing to do, do the hard thing, things that have purpose, have eternal value. His purpose was greater than his life. Think about that. His purpose was greater than his life. Our purpose, church, is greater than our life. You know, when we understand why Jesus was so emotional, about what he was about to suffer, it really puts it into perspective why he asks us to die to ourselves and, and, why he asks, and why he expects us to do so. You know, some say the reason that Jesus was so troubled was that he was contemplating the physical horrors of the cross. And, and I can't discount that completely. I mean, he knew what crucifixion what entailed and, and flogging, and, and there's no way a, a, any human being could just discount that. I mean, some of you, you know, have dread and horror when you have to go to the doctor and get a needle. You know what I mean? Like, seriously, we, we do. We, when we contemplate the possibility of physical pain, we, we get dread and, and, and fear, and I can't discount that. You know, there, I'm sure there was some of that, too. He was a man who felt pain, and, and he knew the pain was coming, and, and, and he knew that the nails and the, and the crown of thorns and, and, the, and the laying of his back, he knew all of that was coming, and that would definitely create some dread in any human being. We can't discount that. But if we think that was the main cause of his turmoil, we're doing him an injustice. When you understand what he was truly truly in turmoil about, it, it changes everything. Um, there have been men in our own time who have died more painful and prolonged deaths than Jesus. You know, people have been tortured and killed and, and done and incredible horrors done to people, you know, even greater than what was done to Jesus. That's not what he was, you know, the dread that he's expressing, the, the, the sweats like has dropped off blood. Um, Jesus said, now my soul is troubled because in a few hours or a few days, I should say, he would bear the sins of the world and he would suffer separation from his father. Think about that. Let that sink in for a minute. Jesus was terribly, you know, emotional and, and, and dreaded what was coming because he would bear our sins. He would bear sins. The, the, the one who knew no sin, right? The, the soul that never sinned, the soul that never knew sin would bear our sins. And, and what does sin do? It, it would separate him from the Father. And he couldn't bear the thought of that, you know. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. His soul, which had never been tainted with sin, 
you know, would have the sins of the universe poured out on him. He was about to endure the wrath of God as he paid for our sins. Kent Hughes said this, his death was sufficient because as an infinite being in a moment of time, he could pay the infinite price for our sin. Amen. That is why he was in turmoil. We, we see it in Mark 14, 34. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death, unto death. He was so sorrowful, so sorrowful that he just unto, that he could die. Have you ever been that sorrowful? Probably not. But sometimes you may have experienced great sorrow. You just wanted to die. Just just let it end. Just just before I have to experience any more of this grief, any more of this dread, just let me die. That, that's how sorrowful he was. And then the next verse, it says he went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. The tense means that he re was repeatedly casting himself to the ground as he was asking his father, just repeatedly walking and, and falling to the ground and, and asking his father if this cup, if this cup could pass, if this cross could pass from me. That is the dread that our Lord and Savior was experiencing as he faced separation from his father. Not the physical pain of the cross as he thought about being separated from his father. He was that emotional. What was Jesus doing by taking on the sin of the world? What does sin do? It causes us to be separated from the father, separated from God. Jesus was dreading being separated from his father. He couldn't bear it. What did he pray in the garden? Abba, Father, dearest Father. What did he say when he was on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Dread. He couldn't bear being, being forsaken by God because that's what sin does. Our sin was put on him and God couldn't even look at his own son because of our sin. And Jesus couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. He couldn't bear the fact that he was separated, that his own father, his heavenly father, couldn't even look at him, that would forsake him, would leave him. Are you getting the emotion here? Are you getting the picture of what Jesus went through? What our sin caused him? You know, we, we like to talk, we do, we talk about the cross and the pain and the torture that he went through, but the real torture was that his father couldn't look at him that he, for, for just a few days, he would be separated from his father. And he couldn't, just think about that. The dread Jesus had facing death as a sinner, being separated from God for a few days. The dread, you know what? That is the dread that every sinner will have for all eternity. Did you get that? The dread that, that I just described, that I did a horrible job of describing. We can't even describe the dread that Jesus had contemplating being separated from his father. That is the dread that every single sinner will face for all of eternity. That is hell, church. Separation from the father. Let me burn, it, but just don't separate me from the father. Don't separate me from his presence. Nothing disturbed Jesus more than being separated from his father. If people just understood what eternity without God was like, everyone would be saved, wouldn't they? If they could just grasp the dread that Jesus had of just a moment without his father, who wouldn't come to know him? Everyone would want to be saved. If they could just see Jesus was with the Father. He knew what it was like. He was in such, he was one with the Father. And he couldn't bear the thought of being separate. One day, you know, we will stand before him and, and, and be cast out of his presence if we don't know his son. And, and we should dread that. If Christians, if Christians truly understood this, we would never take a casual approach, a casual attitude towards sin. Think about that. If we understood the, what sin does, what sin did to Jesus, and what sin could do to us, what sin could lead us to, there is sin that leads to death, isn't there? Sin that, could, you know, that we allow in our life that could, that could turn us away from the Lord, and what sin could do, we would never take a casual approach to sin in our own life. Hughes said, 
Kent Hughes said this, Now my soul is troubled gives us a look into the very heart of Christ as he anticipated that awful horror and desolation. If we truly see this, we will not, we cannot remain the same. We can't, church. You know, religion tries to teach us what the do's and don'ts, right, doesn't it? And it doesn't work. It tries to teach us how to have, you know, how to, to walk a Christian life by doing the right things. You know, what, it doesn't work. But, because what doesn't religion do? It doesn't teach us relationship. We have to know that Jesus was emotional, that he was like us in every way, yet he was God. We have to understand who Jesus was as a person and as God and, and get to know him in relationship. Because when you know somebody in relationship, well, you can feel their pain. Or do you feel his pain this morning as you're getting to know him? We've been walking through the Gospel of John trying to get to know him, not just about him, but to know him intimately. Church, we need to know him intimately. That's why we have to read our Bible and ask God to reveal him intimately. Not just the these and the thous and the do's and the don'ts and all these things. We need to know the person of Jesus Christ. He wants to be our intimate savior because that affects us. When we have relationship with him, that changes our life. He changes our life, not just knowing about him. Religion teaches us all about him. Relationship teaches us him, and we get to know him, the, the real Jesus, the person of Jesus. That's why we're scared to get to know him, because to know him is to love him, and to love him, well, something changes. When you love somebody, you change for that person, you know, and, and that's why we're scared to get to know him. Just teach me about him. Let me just stay. We like to hang all around the cross, but we don't want to get on the cross, because to get on the cross, you have to know him. I know I spent a lot of time on this, but I want you to see the human side of Jesus. He had emotions, and he struggled with them, just like you and I do. But he didn't let his emotions dictate, did he, what he was going to do. He didn't let his emotions dictate, you know, who he was or what he, his purpose. He knew who he was, and he knew what his purpose was. Amen. And we should, you know, if you know your purpose, you're not going to be dictated by every wave of emotion that, that comes by. You'll stay focused on the task God had, even if it troubles your soul deeply. Amen. He says, um, but for this purpose, I came for this hour. You know, what was his purpose? Jesus was willing to endure the cross for his purpose. His purpose was to glorify God. His purpose was to glorify God. It says, it says, Father, glorify your name. Think about that. He was willing to endure the pain of the cross. He was willing to endure the pain of separate, being separated from God simply to glorify his Father. That's incredible. Think of the things we aren't willing to do that would glorify our Father. Oh, I can't do that. Oh, I can't speak in public. Oh, I can't talk to this person. I can't do this. I can't do that because, because of we're afraid or it might, we might be embarrassed or something. The things that we aren't willing to do when Jesus was willing to endure all that he did to glorify his Father. You know, he didn't let his emotions dictate his actions. He didn't let his fears dictate his actions, you know. He says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. You know, <laughs> it's very humbling to think of the things we aren't willing to do, isn't it? McGee said this, we tend to whimper and cry and complain and ask God why he lets unpleasant things happen to us. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious, if that's not true. <laughs> He's, he goes on, with Christ, we should learn to say, Father, through this suffering and through this pain, glorify thyself. We should, you know what I mean? Think before you post. Think before you complain. Think before you whimper. You know. what was Jesus' father's name? Well, Father, it was God. There's a lot of names. We'll talk about that. Maybe we'll do that on a Thursday night. You have to come on a Thursday night. We'll talk about the names of the Father. <laughs> but he heard the voice of God. 
he heard the voice of God audibly. Not only him, all those around him. It, you know, some say that, that there was a multitude of people around him. The word people means there was a multitude of people around him. And they heard the voice of God. This is the third time it, it, God's voice thunders from heaven in the Gospels, isn't it? I hope you know the first, well, it was the first one. It, it was at the beginning of his ministry, wasn't it? When, when he was baptized by John the Baptist and, and the, the, the voice of God thundered. This is, you know, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. The second was on the Mount of Transfiguration, wasn't it? In the middle of his ministry. And, and this is the third time. And when is this? It's at the end of his ministry. But in all three cases, the purpose of the voice was to what? They all, you know, authenticate Jesus as God's son in a dramatic way. You know, so there, they, there was no excuse, was there? I mean, if you missed everything that Jesus did and said, if you missed all the miracles, well, here's a voice from heaven thundering, telling you flat out, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So if you missed all the clues, if you missed every, all the miracles, if you missed everything else, you can't ignore the voice, right? You can't ignore the voice. So the, the voice always had some connection with his death. His baptism signified what? Submission, death, right? Didn't it? He died to himself. The Mount of Transfiguration. What were they talking about? What was Jesus talking about with Moses and Elijah? He was talking about his, his death. You know, they were letting little, Jesus, this is what's going to happen to you. <laughs> yeah. How'd you like to be part of that conversation? You know. And then here, as Jesus struggles with the cross, do you ever hear from the Lord? Does he speak to you? Uh -huh. You know, if not, you know, the question is, where do you stand in relation to the cross? Every time Jesus is thinking about talking about death, he, you know, the voice of God comes and speaks to him as he's, you know, talking about the death he would die and, and what was coming. The voice of God spoke to him. You know, when we die to ourselves, when we're, when we're contemplating our own death, you know, our, our, our death to, to self, well, that's when the Lord will speak to you. You know, when you're not living for yourself, when you're not living to please the flesh, when you're living for Him, when you're living of, when your desire is to glorify God in, in anything that you can, any way that you can, well, guess what? He'll speak to you. It may not be an audible voice. Jesus didn't need this audible voice, did He? He didn't need to hear the, an audible voice. He says, he's, well, am I getting ahead of myself? You know, he, he, he says, you know, the one who hear, the one who dies to self is going to hear the heart and voice of the Father. It, it'll resonate within him. He said it's for your benefit that, I, that, that, that this voice, you know, he didn't need to hear an audible voice. You know, one of the biggest problems I see in the church today is there's, why is there so much confusion and uncertainty? You know, we got a lot going on in our world, and there's no clear direction, no clear answers coming from the church. There's really not. There's no, no one leader or, or group that has come out and give us a clear vision, a clear purpose on what we should do, how we should, you know. And I believe that's because we're, we're thinking about ourselves too much. We're thinking about how all of this affects us personally, and we're not, and we're not thinking about how we can use this to glorify God, how we can use this to win souls. And, and, and our focus is on ourselves. So when our focus is on ourselves, how this is going to affect my freedom, how this is going to affect my kids, how this is going to affect my, when, when we assert the word my or our, guess what we don't hear from? We don't hear from the Lord. But when we say, Lord, how can we use this, turn this situation for your glory? How can we use this situation to, to reach your children with the gospel of Jesus Christ? How can we use this to affect the kingdom of God? Guess what? Then we will hear from the Lord. Then we will hear clear direction and, hear, and clear vision. But we're not. We're just, we're, everything I'm hearing is focused on, on how does this affect me? How does this affect my church, my people, my family? And, and, we're, and there's just nothing but confusion. I, I'm hearing no, at least maybe you've heard, but I haven't heard any clear direction. And, you know, we need to turn our thoughts to glorifying Him. Amen. So... You know, the difference is highlighted right here in verse 29. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. So some heard thunder. Oh, that's not really God. <laughs> that's just thunder. <laughs> really? Others heard something supernatural. Maybe it's an angel. What did Jesus hear? Jesus heard the Father. Jesus heard the Father clearly, didn't he? You know, 
the unsaved looks at the things of God and calls them natural. Oh, that must be thunder. You know, we look at, we were in South Dakota and Colorado, and, and what did I see? I saw, the, I saw God's creation. What did others see? Oh, million, trillions of years of, of erosion and, and, and Mother Nature doing her thing. You know, the unsaved person calls what God has done natural. The carnal Christian looks at the things of God and, and calls them super, supernatural, but they don't understand it. Oh, maybe it was an angel. You know, we, we look at the things God is doing and man, I, see, I know God has his hand in this and, and, and we just, they just don't understand it. They, or they, they misinterpret it, you know what I mean? We, we know there's something spiritual going on, but because I'm a carnal Christian, because I'm not fully invested my life and died to self and living for the Lord, I can't understand, I can't discern what the Spirit of God is telling me. I know, the, I know he's telling me something and we don't think like that. We think we know what he's saying. I've been there. I think I know what he's saying, but, the, but oh, it's an angel. No, it's not an angel. It's the Lord. It's the Father speaking. Jesus knew it was the Father. See, uh, um, those who are filled with the Spirit of Christ, those who have died to self, well, they clearly hear the voice of God and understand it. Do you see the difference here? We see it in the three. We see those who just call it thunder, something natural. We see those who are spiritual but don't understand. But then we see Jesus, who is connected, who is one with the Father. The same Spirit that is in Christ is in us. We should be able to hear the voice of God as clearly as Jesus did, as clearly as Jesus did. Verse thirty says, Jesus answered, "This voice did not come from." because of me, but for your sake. Jesus didn't need to hear an audible voice from God. He knew he was in the Father's will, just like we should know. Listen, if you weren't here Thursday, you missed a really good teaching on the will of God. How do we know the will of God? How do we know if we're in the will of God? And guess what? I'm not gonna teach it to you now, but you should have been here Thursday. But it was a good teaching. How do we know the will of God? The same way Jesus did. The same way Jesus, Jesus was 100% confident he was in the will of God. He didn't need to hear an audible voice of God. He was one with the Father. He has given us the, his spirit. His spirit lives with the, within us. We can know the Father's will just as confidently, just as sure as Jesus did. Sorry you missed that lesson. The voice came so there could be no doubt. But there was still doubt, wasn't there? Not even the audible thundering voice of God could cause some to believe. Still many didn't believe. Some did, many did, but still, think about that. A multitude of people and, and the crowd is divided. It was thunder, it was an angel. How could you hear the voice of God and, and call it thunder? Still, with all the signs, with everything Jesus said about himself, there was still doubt. And with doubt comes what? Judgment. Judgment. Verse 31 says, now is the judgment of this world. You know, Corson, John Corson said, that which has damned man, that which has held mankind in bondage, sin is being judged by my going to the cross, Jesus declared. He lived a sinless life. He was perfect. And sinful mankind judged him <laughs> and put him on a cross. And in effect, we've judged ourselves. Jesus didn't judge us. He, he, we judged ourselves when we put him on that cross. We judge ourselves when we deny him today. When we turn from him, we're judging ourselves. So we will stand before him one day. And we stand guilty as charged. And we'll know it. We're not going to stand, but, but you don't understand, Jesus. I... I, I I just didn't understand when I was there. No, we will know we were guilty. We will know that we willingly rejected the free gift of salvation that he offered. We will be without excuse. We will stand judged and we will be just at, at his mercy at, at that day. We will be without excuse. Unless, some, unless you receive him now as your Lord and Savior, you will face him as your judge. As long as there's breath in our lungs, we can receive him as Lord and Savior. Once there's no more breath, once we die, we will face him as judge. There will be judgment. And he goes on to say, And now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Who's the ruler of this world? Satan. Satan has the power over this world. 
Satan has the power. God originally gave it to Adam and Eve, didn't he? And Adam and Eve surrendered it to Satan. Satan has been the ruler of this world ever since. Make no bones about it. The Bible speaks about it. You know, Satan has been the ruler. He has an influence infected this world. The cross was the blow that defeated Satan, wasn't it? The, the end of his aid, the, end, the ruler of this world will be cast out. The cross is what defeated Satan. What Satan thought the cross, Satan thought the cross would end Jesus? <laughs> Think about that. He was duped, wasn't he? <laughs> he thought the cross would end Jesus when in turn the cross ended him. I love that. Well, praise the Lord. So in verse 34, he says, this he said, signifying what death he would die. So they, you know, one day Satan and his demons, oh, I've skipped this. I'm sorry, 32 and 33. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying what death he would die. One day Satan and his demons will be cast out completely. He's still the ruler of this world, isn't he? One day he will be, he will be, cast, he will be cast out completely, never to be dealt with again. But today, he's still the ruler of this world. But not for you and me. He is not, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he is not your ruler. You got to get that through your heads because we don't understand that. You know, I got a, had a question the other day from somebody's, uh, somebody I know, they've been a, they're a spiritual mentor of mine. They've been a Christian for a long, long time, but they, they don't understand that concept. If, if sin is, you know, talking about Romans 6 or, you know, we're dead to sin and alive in Christ. If, if sin has been, you know, done away with, how can we still sin? Oh, my goodness. You should know the answer to that. If you've been a Christian any amount of time, you should understand. You know, we are still connected to the flesh, but you better understand that sin has been defeated. Satan has been defeated in your life. You need to walk in the fact that your victory has already been won. You are no longer a slave to Satan. You are no longer a slave to sin. Unless you understand that, how could you be a Christian for any amount of time and not understand that? Unless you understand that, you're going to continue to walk in sin. You're going to continue to be a slave to sin. You are no longer, a you have to crucify the flesh. If you're walking in sin, it's not God's fault. He already set you free from it. You need to walk in the victory that he's already provided, that he's already won. Satan is not your ruler. You left the kingdom of earth and became a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Walk as a citizen of the kingdom that you rightfully belong in. We try to walk in both, don't we? Or we zigzag. You know, we walk in here Monday through Friday. Then only go back to the, king, to the kingdom of God on Sunday. No. Walk as a citizen of the kingdom of God. It's the victory that has already been won. Let them deal with the dominion of Satan. You walk in victory. You, sin has been defeated in your life. If you have sin in your life, reigning in your life, it's not because it hasn't been defeated on the cross. You have power over that. It's because you willingly want to hold on to it. Understand that the sin in your life you are allowing to be there. The Spirit of God is there to eradicate, to remove that sin. You'd have to make a choice. You have to choose Jesus over your sin. I've been there. I've done that. And I've been set free from sin. I know what that experience is like. And the freedom that Christ has offered you is, is greater than anything you could ever imagine. So he says in verse 34, the people answered him, we have heard from the law. OK, now they're thinking we this is what we think. We, we know better than you. This is what I've learned from, from the law. This is what I've been taught my whole life. Forget about the voice from heaven. Forget about the miracles. Forget about Lazarus being raised from the dead, which we just saw. Forget about all that. This is what I know. Jesus, let me correct you on, on, on what you, your theology is wrong, Jesus. Let me, let me correct you. Let me straighten you out, Jesus. He says, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the, who is the Son of Man? Jesus, you're not going to die. The, or if, if you're really the Messiah, no, this is, you're, you're not going to die. They're trying to correct Jesus. They believe, they believe the Messiah would never die, you know, and I'm not going to go all into that. And so the, we know the cross was a stumbling block to them. You know, the Bible tells the cross, his death was a stumbling block to them to this day. You know, they, because they know better. 
They know better. They let their theology you know, get in the way uh, of receiving Jesus, and it became a stumbling block. Don't let what you think. <laughs> I, always, I like to tell people when I'm ministering to them, are you willing to bet your eternity on what you believe from the way you, from your life experience, from the way you've grown up? Are you willing to bet your eternity that you are right and the Bible is wrong? <laughs> and that, that G, what Jesus said with his own mouth is wrong? I'm not. I think I'm going to surrender what, what I've learned. You know, there's a lot I've learned in my public school education that, that, I don't, that I'm not going to bet my life on. You know, that the earth is, you know, I don't know how many billions of years they're up to now. But no, I'm going to believe the Bible. I'm going to believe what Jesus says. So, so how does Jesus answer him? He says, then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become the sons of light. So he didn't really answer their question, did he? <laughs> he never does. <laughs> he never does. He, you know, I love that because he, he just doesn't waste time. He, we, we waste time answering questions after question after question with people, and, and it does no good. It does no good, because you can answer their questions, and they're still not going to believe. So what does he tell them? He says, look, he says, he says light or darkness, make a choice. Light or darkness, you got enough information. Make a choice. Choose light or choose darkness. You know, if you choose light, walk in the light. If not, you're going to walk in darkness for the, for the rest of your life. Make a choice. You got enough information. You heard the voice of God for crying out loud. Make a choice. Make a choice, light or darkness. Sometimes you just got to let people choose. Just make a choice. We can't save everybody. Jesus couldn't save everybody. Neither could we. When we see the cross, we have to choose. Everyone's drawn to the cross. When I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Every time we look at the cross, we have to make a choice. Reject what it means. We know it means something. Or accept what it means. You've got to make a choice. Everyone has to decide what side of the cross they want to be on. Think about that. Remember when Jesus was on the cross? He had um, on the one side, there was a dying thief. He died blaspheming God and went to eternity separated from God. And on the other side, there was a dying thief. And, and, and he believed. And, and he died and he went to be with Jesus for all eternity. You know, we have to pick a side. We're going to, we're, and we, we can't, there's no neutral zone. There's no in-between. We either choose as the, as the thief and, and deny him, or we choose as the other thief, because we're all thieves, aren't we? None of us are righteous, no, not one. Maybe you're here today and you haven't chosen to believe. Maybe you, have, maybe you've, you, know, maybe you haven't even contemplated it, but you, you can't miss the cross behind me. The cross behind me makes you make a choice. You're in church today. You have to make a choice. You just can't. Yeah, I don't know. You have to make a choice. I see. See, Arlene's not here to patch it. <laughs> We need, no, I don't, I don't know. I, I, have, I, I leave that to Jesus. You have to make a choice. You know, are you willing to bet your eternity? <laughs> you know, are you willing to bet your eternity that, that, that you're right? That, you know what, God is a good God. If he's a good God, he, he would never send anybody to hell. He would never, you know, if, if God is a good God, my, he'll forgive. You know, God's grace will cover my sin. I don't need to worry about sin because he died, and I don't have to worry about sin. And, and are you willing to bet your eternity that you're right? Or were you willing to take Jesus at his word and say, look, you don't want the eternity separate from God. He couldn't bear the thought of a moment separated from God, from his Father, let alone an eternity you know, so I just want to give you an opportunity. He, he, the cross made it easy. He conquered death, hell, and the grave when he died on that cross. He, he took on all of our sins, past, present, and future. He took on all of our sins on that cross. So we don't have to. To glorify his Father. He was motivated by the, to glorify his Father and motivated by his love for us. Think about that. 
He wanted to glorify his Father, and he, and, he, and he loved us enough to die for us. He lived for his Father. And you heard the message. It may not be easy. <laughs> he may call you to things, to places where, where, that will trouble your soul, but it's worth it. It's worth it. You know, we could face the situations, the circumstances, the, the health problems, the financial problems, the, the family problems, the difficulties of this world in a totally different way, a totally different way if we embrace Jesus Christ. So I just want to ask you this morning, if, if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, put him on the throne of your life. Walk as a citizen of the kingdom of God, no longer walking in darkness, but choosing the light of life. Just ask you to raise your hand this morning because we'd like to say a prayer with you. If, if you've never done that, we'd like to pray with you. Just a simple prayer. We'll all do that with you. We'll praise the Lord. And, and I know that's a rededication, but that's okay. And if there's anyone else that would like to join our sister, she raised her hand and and of receiving Jesus, really surrendering all to Jesus. Listen, I know none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect, but so often we, we fall so short of what God really wants for us, and, and we need to just surrender all. So we're just going to say a prayer with our sister, and if there's anyone, anyone want to say that prayer, join her in that prayer. We'll all say it with you. Anyone this morning? Well, let's all say this prayer. And I like this prayer. I got it. You know, Pastor Rick has a great prayer, but... Uh, it's just a simple prayer from Billy Graham. And I always say, if it worked for him, it worked for me. And it worked for us. But it's just believing in your heart, right? I don't know whatever God spoke to you this morning. You know, he, he speaks to us and it probably, you know, you'll probably tell me what it was. I'm like, I didn't say that. Because <laughs> that's how God works. He works in our spirit. He works through our spirit. So God bless you, sis. And, and let's just, well, can we all say this with her? All right. Dear God, Dear God. I know I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died for, for my sin and that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as Lord. From this day forward, guide my life. Help me to do your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. God bless you, sis. We give her a round. Thank you for your boldness in raising your hand. And, and, you know, welcome to the family of God and welcome to a new commitment, you know, and, and just allowing the Lord to, to, to lead us and guide us. Uh, I've been a Christian, I guess, almost, I guess it's almost 30 years now. I, I, I don't, it, it's the one thing you can do in life that the more you surrender of yourself, the better it gets. Think about that. The better it gets, the better it gets. It's a matter of surrendering. The more I can find, listen, you get to a point where you just look for things to surrender. Lord, search my heart. Like David said, search my heart. Know that what is within me, that there, there, there's nothing in me that's holding me back from you. You know, because you just want to surrender. You just want to be closer to him. You know, for the rest of us, Jesus had a purpose, didn't he? In his purpose, he demonstrated his love for us. And he glorified his heavenly father. That's now our purpose as well. To, to glorify our father and to demonstrate his love to others. Think about that. That is our purpose. When we receive him, our whole purpose in life is to glorify our Father. Isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Glorify your Father. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love others. That's our purpose, church. He's given it to us, the same purpose he had. Well, that was the effect of his purpose, but that wasn't his purpose. Think about that. The purpose, that wasn't his purpose. Why did Jesus come and die on the cross? What was his purpose in doing that? It was to defeat Satan. Jesus had to come and die, not to glorify the Father, not to show his love for us. He had to come and die to defeat Satan. That was the only way to defeat Satan because man created the problem. Man sinned, so man had to fix the problem. God couldn't just erase it. That's out of, that's not in his design, his, his will and his design for plan. He gave man dominion, so man had to fix the problem. So Jesus had to become a man to defeat Satan. Think about this. Let this sink in. 
His purpose was to defeat Satan. In doing so, he glorified God and he demonstrated his love for us. Think about that. He came to defeat the ruler of this world. When we continue to sin, that is the opposite of glorifying God and loving our neighbors and loving people, isn't it? Sin is serious. Sin is something to take serious, church. It's not something to be casual about. Jesus came to defeat Satan. So when we sin, what are we doing? Who are we glorifying when we sin? Are we glorifying God when we sin? We are glorifying Satan. Do you think he relishes that? Look what your child is doing. Do you think he tries to rub that in the face of God? When we sin, when we willfully sin, we are glorifying Satan. Don't come to church saying, I love the Lord, when we're willfully sinning in our life. There's willful sin because we are glorifying, we are rubbing it in the face, allowing, we are giving Satan, you know, things to rub in the face of God when his children sin. That's why God was so confident in Job. Go ahead, test Job. Job's going to be faithful. He may question me, yeah, but he's going to be faithful. Test my servant, Job. What happens when Satan tests you? When we don't show love to our neighbor, we're given the enemy. <sighs> Ammunition, you know. We're giving the enemy things to, to, to show, to glorify himself. Look, I told you your people wouldn't be no, would be no good. I told you the cross wouldn't be no good. Church, if there's ever been a time to get serious about your walk with the Lord, it is today. It is right now. God needs his church to be serious. You know, I used to think when I was a newer believer, man, do I really want to get this serious <laughs> about this whole Christianity thing? Can, can I just, you know, can I just, just go to church and, and be a good person and learn and, and, and hang all around the cross? Does it, do I really have to be serious about this? You know what? So many of us stop right there and, and we never get serious. Why do you take it so seriously? You know, I mean, it's just, you know, you, you can do your thing and, and grace. You got grace. And why is it got to be so? Listen, it's a serious matter. Sin is a serious matter. We need to confront the sin in our life. And do it, wait with it. He's given us everything we need. Amen. Oh, I hope you get that. I hope you get that. Well, let's just pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit being present with us. I pray that we hear the voice of God this morning. Thank you for that one who, who has heard and, and, and committed her life to you, Lord. Be with her as she follows you all the days of her life. Strengthen her. May she be in tune with you, Lord. Fill her with your spirit that she would be able to hear the voice of God, that you would lead her and guide her, that she would know that she's walking in the center of your will. Lord, give her just a burning desire to, to open your word and study for herself, to show herself approved, Lord, and to, to be involved in the things of God and to Bible studies and such, to, to put people alongside of her to help her grow. And Lord, for the rest, for all of us, Lord, may we truly get serious, Lord, about the things of God, about the sin in our life, Lord, the things that are holding us back, the things that are dishonoring to you that are glorifying the devil Lord may we truly be serious Lord we see how your son Lord was so emotional as he present prepared to be you know be crucified on that cross to be separated from you may that motivate us may that move us Lord in relationship with him in our love for him to to cleanse our lives Paul got it he said and therefore in my brothers my sisters in view of God's mercy in view of what he's done Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Lord, may we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, no longer concerned about the things, the affairs of this world, but about the affairs of the kingdom of heaven, that we would truly be effective and fruitful. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it won't be fruitful. Unless we die to ourselves, we will be of no good to you. Lord, you say that to be lukewarm is, to, is, is, is horrible, that you would even spew us out of your mouth. Lord, may your church be hot. <laughs> Lord, may we be on fire. May we be serious about the things of God. Lord, may it begin right now. May we repent in our hearts and say, Lord, and make you Lord of our lives today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord.